नेक्स्ट सेशन द सेशन सिक्स द सेशन इज अबाउट लॉजिस्टिक्स विजन ट्वेंटी थर्टी बिल्डिंग कोलाबरेशन एंड दिस सेशन इज मॉडिटेड बाय द सेशन चेयरमैन मिस्टर आर राधा कृष्णन पास चेयरमैन एंड बोर्ड ऑफ एडवाइजर ट्रिबल एफ ए आई सो लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन प्लीज गिव अर राउंड ऑफ अ ब्लॉज टू मिस्टर आर राधा कृष्णन एंड वेलकम हिम टू द डाइज Mr R Radhakrishnan is the current advisor and past chairman Triple F AI Federation of Freight Forwarders Association National Apex Body of 24 Custom Broker Association of India current advisor of past president of BCBA past trustee of Mumbai Port Trust past trustee of Jawaharlal Jawaharlal Nehru Post Trust past director of IFCBA International Federation of Custom Brokers past director of fiata international apex body of freight forwarders association located around the globe past president of indian institute of freight forwarders sir thank you so much for joining with us sir thank you and next followed by i would like to call upon mr n r su kurunishan iaph regional director to india so please welcome on to the stage can we give him a round of applause ladies and gentlemen Shrimati Vandana Agarwal madam please welcome to the stage senior economic advisor MOCA retired chairperson committee of on SAFAL IFSCA gift city ma'am please welcome on to the stage i would request ladies and gentlemen to join your hands together and welcome her with your huge round of applause to the dais please and now i would like to welcome mr k kubomi gazdar md and ceo Avia Pro Logistics Services Private Limited please welcome on to the stage sir can you all join with me to invite him to the stage with your applause please thank you And now i would like to welcome mr raghavendra vishwanathan ceo freight 5 so please welcome on to the stage an applause people thank you Finally I would like to welcome Mr Sudhir Agarwal honorary treasurer Triple F AI so please welcome on to the stage a big round of applause people come on thank you good afternoon who all are awake after the morning session um i have been asked to moderate this session logistic vision 2030 building collaborators and when i asked dr santanu what i am supposed to do as a moderator he mentioned to me speak less and allow the speaker to speak more so i am not going to take too much of a time to speak and talk about the subject for today because i find along with me on the dais there are domain experts in the each of the topic they are going to speak if i am going to speak i will be bit out of place i want them so i'll refrain from talking on the subject they are all going to talk and become more a listener here and a moderator and i have been told that only thing you maintain the time do not allow them to speak more than the time they have been given but today we are little privileged compared to yesterday so i will be little liberal so that if they extend the time then what what is given to them every one of them is going to get about 15 minutes to speak i so i hope it is 15 minutes yeah and um, if they uh, then if we get time we'll go for 
question answer and um, another point is like yesterday tej was mentioning after this session after his session summit which was after lunch he said people are going to become hungry but i am sure after this session everyone of us is going to become hungry or going to go for dining hall and have lunch and um, along with me i would say ki yes i think it's uh, difficult for me to introduce the panelists because all of them were coming with a not just experience in india they are all coming with experience both in india and abroad etc for the youngster around year around only youngster is a entrepreneur mr raghavendra vishwanathan uh, other panelists i think many of them all the three of them require no introduction because all of us have been dealing with them in the past but i got to do the job of a brief introduction though i got it's running in pages each one of their introduction if i got to give possibly we cannot have session so i'll be as brief and i taken the permission of the panelists to only speak a very little about them because uh, and they agreed that yes, you don't have to speak the entire page that is with me the first speaker today is going to be enter to coronation is going to speak on maritime and port is going to is going to speak on port infrastructure and nrsu coronation we all know is one of the unique person in this port sector who has got not only experience uh, in just uh, ports in india he has got experience in ports abroad and he has worked in both our own uh, government ports also in the private ports and a man with lot of experience and vision and nrsu coronation has more than 33 years of leadership in maritime sectors including 22 years in the capacity of president director and ceo and chief executive in global ports and logistic system he has a demonstrated history of working in mumbai port pndo ports dubai ports world Ad, dubai ports world adani ports and special economic zone mundra Mr. Nr. Sukarnation, a multifaceted personality, is also concerned for people on health and safety and environmental green movement activities. He is a good team player. He was instrumental in transforming Indian container exim trade to double its growth in 15 years and received more than 25 awards for his seamless service to the exim trade of India and abroad. That's not fair. i think uh, we are going to give what we the way we clap for the minister one thing i would say ki yes the claps is a encouragement to speak up and if we don't clap they will not come and speak for us next time so all of us are going to be liberal not stingy in clapping so that they get encouraged they are there with us every time we call them so over to mr nr sukarnation hello while i wait for the slide change first of all i love to compliment congratulate uh, mr shankar shinde for transforming triple fai where i have seen there used to be a number of very long queue in mumbai port in late 1980s for tracing the cargo and containers and yesterday he launched e fiata bl that kind of transformation thank you mr shankar shinde your vision has uh, today evolved for the global industry it's amazing achievement and also i have to compliment mr Dushyan Mulani, Chairman Elect, where I had privilege to work in Mumbai Port Trust. We used to have issues in Mumbai Port, but today we are all talking about more on global scenario. And as uh, Devashish was mentioning, that face of customs is triple FAA. 
but i would say face of trade triple f a why because recently chabahar port when i was amazed with instc international north south trade corridor bringing that kind of vision for the country that's again another hat you are wearing fabulous that's another spirit of triple f a i i also have to thank mr vijay kumar he is the man of action who has always tried to do lot of things in a different way solution his action speak louder than words that's a kind of spirit where he's brought out quite a lot of initiatives in south during his hum of affair of the triple f a i so with this with all the dignitaries on the dais of the dais my topic is more on the port supply driven infrastructure since i hail from more than 33 years of the port industry mumbai has given me the entire platform to raise to this level before moving on to the global scenario i would like to touch upon the globe is today touching 100 trillion dollars of economy and you all know that us is continue to be number 1 25 trillion dollar economy and china 20 trillion dollar economy and japan 5 trillion dollar economy the chase is between now the india and uk the fifth and sixth position but i am sure with this triple fa and the logistics fraternity that we would be the third largest economies of the world i am 100% confident the coming years india is going to be a global india looking at the 5 trillion economy 5 trillion dollar economy this is what we talk about in the in the era of 100 trillion dollar global gdp and having said so the 100 trillion dollar global gdp what really matters today in terms of the trade global trade 2020 has seen 17.58 trillion dollars of exports the trade has grown more than the imports the trade has transformed into the export driven system out of the total exim of 35.49 trillion dollars approximately 35% of gdp is more towards the imports and exports and containers have taken the prominent role in the maritime transport 812 million tons of containers being handled across 900 container terminals on the ports where the container has proven to be a continuous maritime transport of the world and that is where today we are going to talk about much on that where 2022 global trade scenario has quite changed trillion dollars increases over the year the current last year that's because of the rise in commodity prices tightening policies geopolitical terms frictions negatively even though affected the global trade but global trade continued to excel and this year expected to be 21 trillion dollars of uh, global trade the exports which is going to be there when we seen that kind of the massive global trade what is happening in the cargo volume across the global ports you all know that 200 2000 global ports 0.9 billion tons of cargo in the tankers wet bulk which is in the form of petroleum and crude oil and dry cargo in the form of dry bulk and containers and general cargo which is 7.89 billion tons of cargo overall 10.8 billion tons of cargo which is being handled across the global ports such a and global ports capacity is 60 billion tons of cargo across the globe all the ports when you put together having said, said so when that kind of volume of cargo is vanished across the globe the ship size which is increasing from 2500 tons vessels today we talk about 24000 tons container vessels gone are the days 1980s we only considered to be 2500 tons vessels to be 
larger, and today we talk about not less than 24,000 TUs container vessels. 24,000 TUs container vessels has having a multiplier effect on the land side activities. That's where we all hear how we are going to handle the situation. The entire supply chain has to figure out how that kind of massive exchange which is going to be brought to the land side, are we enough to handle such kind of situation? That's where we are, we are coming into the picture. When global ports and terminals continue to be faster, higher productivity, shipping market consolidation which is happening, regional ports in the competition, transshipment ports are having a global operations and still more and more competition which is arising. Having seen that size of volume, the, the uh, size of ship, what is happening in the ports? Ports are in transition, which is where 1940s it is more on mechanical ports, and 1960 container ports, 1980s it's EDA ports, 2000 it is internet ports, and 2020 it's nothing but smart ports. This is where the globe is moving, but India still continue to be there as uh, EDA ports. We don't have much over like internet and internet of thinkings, uh, things and also moving to the connected ports with the cloud-based operating system still not come. Look at here the top 10 global ports. Seven are in China, which is more than 20 million to use of containers. But in India's overall all the 15, uh, 27 container terminals, we handle only 20 million to use of containers. While we marching towards a $5 trillion economy, are we really focusing on building mega infrastructure? That's where the challenge, that's where the Maritime India Vision 2030 is all going to talk about. What is uh, really matters in terms of mega port infrastructure? How I have seen the previous slide in terms of all these 10 ports constitutes 268 millions of containers out of 812 millions of containers handled annually across global ports where India has looking at mega ports. What are the real mega port as a connected port? There are three determinants which are needed for the mega ports. One is the cargo volume. You need to have larger parcel size of cargo volume to have construct a mega port and you have to create economic value which will be the game changer for the country. And land and water surface have to be abundantly available in the country. Then this will create a mega port, which is what today we talk about Singapore and Barcelona and Rotterdam and JNPT and also Mundra. These are all certain classic case where the mega ports which is already evolved. And mega port constitutes and contributes one third of regional economy and Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Dubai, Hong Kong, Singapore, these are all the witness mega ports, witnesses which has uh, happened in the last century. Look at the drivers of mega ports. Why you need to have a mega ports? If India is not really looking beyond that what we talk about only the 14,000 TUs vessels, again we will be left over. We will have mega ships which are already 24,000 TUs, mega cities which is what rising in India, and globalized economic model, you need to have a longer key length. You can't just have a 300 meter berth as considered to be enough. You need to have a 500 meter berth and you need to handle uh, like 400 meter vessels with the 1000 meter key length which is what needed. And deep draft ports are required to be there in India and bigger yard, which is 100 hectares land, which is what needed. What we have is in India is 19th century, 20th century infrastructure. We don't have a 21st century infrastructure. The consolidation of shipping lines only come when we have the mega ports which is available here. What really it is going to transform the industry? Zero birthing time. Dr. Shamila was mentioning in the morning time that 1990s Chennai port was not ready to handle, but that today the situation has quite changed supply-driven infrastructure which has been created. All over the world, when the ports are congested, but in India, we don't have any congestion at all. Even during the COVID, post-COVID, even today, because Honorable Prime Minister has envisaged 
where there are 1.5 billion tons of cargo, we have a 2.5 billion tons of capacity. 2030 Maritime India Visions talk about 3.6 billion tons of capacity which is being uh, planned for the next 10 years. So we are marching towards a supply driven infrastructure. There ships will be, the birds will be waiting for the ship. That kind of transformation which is happening. Mega ports are going to add more and more towards the mega supply chain. Mega port led supply chain which is going to be more for aggregating more volumes. It will bring down the logistics cost of the India and logistics cost of the trade. This is what we talk about the mega ports. What is really another very important aspect for country which is mega transshipment ports. You all know that the transshipment ports across globe and all are in clustered in Asia, Singapore, Malaysia, Dubai, Colombo. These are all certain major mega transshipment ports which is arise. Why there is a genesis of transshipment? Shipment from Durban to Manila, there is no direct connection. It has been necessarily how to break the journey at Singapore and Singapore has acted as a transshipment port. This is uh, just to give an academic interest to the knowledge for the fraternity here. Today, global shipping, the core route, India has well positioned in terms of raising the mega transshipment port in South. We here we talk about hub and spoke. India has can adopt both hub and spoke and relay network, which will have a multiplier effect in terms of cargo movement in the country. 1970s, Singapore has evolved, which is a port of Singapore as a transshipment port. Today, Singapore handles 37.5 million TUs of containers annually, and last year, Singapore handled 37.5 million TUs with the 50 million tons of cargo bunker alone. There are ports in India, we have struggled to handle 50 million tons of cargo, but whereas there, the cargo, the bunker sales alone 50 million tons, single port handle 599 million tons of cargo. Ships more than 2.8 billion gross tonnage, which is what happened. What has happened after 1970s, 1990s, Malaysia port, Port Kilang has set which is today, I, I had a fortunate enough to go and started the operation in 1996. And today this port has evolved as a number one fast growing port in Malaysia and in Asia, which is 11 million TUs containers have in less than 20 years. Similarly, when it comes in 2000, Malaysia's Johu port, port of Tanjang Palipas, this is another port which has evolved in the last 20 years. This port also has handled 11 million TUs of containers which is another massive mega infrastructure which has been built in Malaysia. Less than 20 years, Malaysia has garnered 20 million tons of containers. And 2010, Sri Lanka port has emerged as the southern tip of India, which is another uh, port, which is a Sri Lanka port, is another transshipment port. This is again handled 7.3 million tons. But this port is thriving on our containers, which is being transshipped. More than 50, 60 percent of the containers are rising from India and that's being transshipped. What really is India overseas? Over, overview of India, as Honorable Prime Minister has already set the record, the, the goal as $5 trillion economy, the self-reliant, inward-looking, import-driven to export competitive, make in India for make, make for the world, exports, export value-added goods. That's where the supply chain, the logistics industry about it. yesterday we spoke enough in terms of value added goods. That's where we are into and raw material to finish goods. So import driven trade to a five hundred billion dollars of export competitive trade. This is what we all talk about. And India's trade is marching towards a trillion dollar by 2025, which is not uh, uh, something not achievable with your continuous relentless effort. I'm confident that a trillion dollar exports, which would be enough, which would be easier to handle, uh, reach by 2025. The major ports already started transition. You all know that 19, until 2000, major ports considered to be a huge employment, employment service. But 2020, last 20 years, it is all more on the 
PPP models, global operators have come, and today, now they have started evolving to a landlord port. Massive landlord port concept where I have to compliment the uh, port which is there in the West Coast is the Mundra port. And Samir Bhai is here and Gautama has to be complimented. If that port is not today and whatever the trade, the whatever logistics card we talk about, which will be not 14%, it will go beyond 14% because this port has given a kind of relief to the NCR region which has more than 32 berths and 8,000 meter key length and it has a 250 million tons which is the mega transshipment as well as mega ports. This is what India has witnessed. Overall for India, $5 trillion economy and $215 billion of logistics market, cargo and goods have to connect the interland which is of 3.3 million square kilometer. The logistics performance index have to raise in the top 30 as against today we are 44 and we are incurring additional cost of 250 million dollars annually which is lost due to our containers and cargo being transshipped in the neighboring ports. Why transshipment occurs? There is no direct link between ports and we don't have, even though we are proximity to mainline route but we don't have a deep draft, we are unable to accommodate larger size, parcel size, no capacity in the port, no liner shipping connectivity. And today, we are losing $200 million annually, additional cost to the India trade. And 75% of the cargo has been transshipped to the neighboring ports. And India transshipment hub is essential at this point in time. Though we are connected, we are in the east-west trade lane, which will make India as the mega transshipment center of the port. I have another. And as uh, here, I would like to touch upon, there are uh, quite a lot of studies in the Maritime India Vision 2030 states, but uh, mainly there is a competition between Tutigurin and Cochin and Virinjam. These are all the ports are considered to be a mega transshipment port, which is going to be happening in the next uh, five to 10 years. And as uh, there is a clear evidence that containers can be easily transshipped at these ports, and which will save the country in terms of our exchequer $250 million annually and which will create a, a complete value-added service to the port. Now time is India for to transshipment, build transshipment mega ports. My role as a representative is International Association Ports and Harbors. We are talking more on today, we talk about the climate and energy and sustainability data collaboration, risk and resilience, and these are all the certain things where the International Association for Port and Arbors, which will bring the best practices of the global ports and to India, we will be working with all the entire port community, and I am sure this will be another game changer for India. Gati Shakti India, I think yesterday, even Honorable Minister Nitin Gadkari was talking, and our minister was talking, mega ports and transshipment ports, we are going to invest $20 billion. Sagarmala has already seen $30 billion. Bharat Mala, where the trade corridors, more than 30,000 kilometers, $60 billion. DFC, 8,500 kilometers of rail corridors, another $30 billion. Multimodal connectivity, CFS, ICDs, RCDs, and also the technology adoption today in the morning. We spoke much on that, on the PCS and NLP and UL, ULIP and IoT and blockchain. And here, there are few takeaways during this session that for I would urge FFA how to take these six major uh, focus which is needed for the country, building mega ports in the West Coast and East Coast, building transshipment mega hub in the south, south, southern part of India. India should own mega shipping line. I think the top five shipping lines of the world, the MSC and MERS and CMS, CGM, Costco and we have uh, Apecloy. These are all only it's added in the global scenario whereas India we don't have our own shipping line. And container manufacturing centers, hyperloop freight corridors and smart ports and smart logistics. These are all the big ticket items which is available for FAA to take it to the government and I'm sure as you 
really spearheading the trade vision, India's trade vision, which you will transform maritime India to handle mega ships, to construct mega ports, and also as we already equipped the dedicated freight corridor, which will have a multiplier effect handling double stack container trains, and also we will look at the next 10 years. Now it is in the drawing board, the hyperloop freight corridor, which has been recently tested between Mumbai and Pune. And this has to come in a reality. Containers can land in JNPT, come to Chennai, and it can connect the eastbound. That's the kind of transformation which we are looking at in the next 10 years. With this, uh, thank you, one and all. And uh, it's a wonderful time that we had with the 600 delegates. And I'm sure with your vision, taking this country to the next step, that India is going to be a global India in terms of maritime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, NRSO. I think it's been a great pleasure to have you with us because we, every time you speak, there is a volume of knowledge that you give, up, uh, give to us. And the, you mentioned about mega ports, mega ships, and mega transshipment ports. The future, I think, we all will also take more inputs from you because 20 minutes is sh too short a time, like Mr. Devashi was mentioning, that we are going to have less speakers in every session or we have to have a separate module for port, half a day business session for port. I will request chairman of AAA, maybe he can have, if not possible, like a physical uh, business session, but you can have a mini virtual conference for one one subject so that we are able to take it forward. Definitely, we will give more time to uh, for you the next possibly a session. But 20 minutes was shoot too short a time to understand this. Now we will go to the next speaker. I think our next speaker require no introduction because especially during this pandemic time, she has been a COVID warrior and uh, helping all of us in the from the Ministry of Civil Aviation uh, and. Uh, Thank you, madam, for the excellent support that you gave it to us. Without you, the freight forwarding industry would have not been able to move their goods during this pandemic time. And uh, let me give a brief introduction. Again, it runs in pages. I had requested, madam, that I will just read a few para of your uh, profile. Um, Vandana Agarwalji has been a career civil servant and economist for about 36 years. Having joined the prestigious Indian Economic Service Government of India in 1986 after studies at the University of London and Delhi School of Economics, presently she is nearing a completion of her PhD degree for, from University of Delhi. I think all the best for your PhD degree, madam. She last served as Senior Economic Advisor, Additional Secretary and Divisional Head for a number of new initiatives in the Ministry of Civil Aviation for over four years, besides serving on the Board of Directors of Central Public Corporates Council, such as AAICLAS. After superannuating from the post of, post of Senior Economic Advisor, Additional Secretary in the Ministry of Civil Aviation, she is currently serving as a chairperson committee on ship acquisition, financing and leasing project SAFAL, set up by the Industrial Financial Services Centers Authority of India, Gift City, and Member Research Council for Development of Aviation, Aerospace, Sciences and Technologies, Infrastructure, Facilities and Expertise. She is well versed in policy dialogues with stakeholders, think tanks, and key players in central and state governments, Reserve Bank of India, and financial institution, sector regulators, and multilateral agencies in order to build consensus through negotiation and facilitate reforms in agriculture, uh, manufacturing, infrastructure, logistic, and service sector. I think it's like that our customs, somewhat is Samadhan. So I think, thank you very much. We are happy to have her here with us. Please, madam. I have told you, please clap more because so that we can have Vandana ji again and again.
the panelists who have spoken and also uh, in anticipation of the wonderful words you're going to hear, the words of wisdom from all of them. And I don't know who all to thank from all my friends in the floor and uh, on the floor. And it's, it's, it's uh, for me such a happy time to be here. It's all friends with whom we worked so closely in such a collaborative manner, in such a cooperative spirit. And uh, what was said that we were able to weather many of the supply chain problems in aviation and also in, in uh, sync with roads and railways and shipping simply because the industry worked as one together. The industry together worked as one with the government. Academia worked as one with the government and industry. And I think everybody thought out of the box. The little X that we saw, which was outside the knots and crosses, that is where everybody uh, was. And it was, this has to be done. Yes, it will be done. There was never a question which was posed back, it's going to be difficult, it's going to be impossible, it will take time, it will be costly. These are usually words that we hear every time a development initiative is to take place on the shores of our wonderful India. And, but in the crisis, the Jugadu culture worked at its best. And the readiness, actually, to call it Jugadu culture is actually not to give, um, although it, that, that word has a pejorative value when it's used sometimes, but I didn't use it pejoratively. I used it with all the positive energy which I had earlier said. And that is a measure of the fact that we have been doing something right in setting up systems, governance systems, physical infrastructure, financing, regulation, what have you we have been able to address holistically something that in such a fa far reaching global pandemic, which went on not, not for one day of floods or two days of uh, uh, a cataclysmic event, but for two years. And we were able to meet all the aspirations, I think, of the people of India and of the world at large. I'll now uh, gone. It's disappeared from me. I pressed green, but it didn't come. Oh, it's come. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, Logistics Vision 2030 is about building collaborations. You all have already <coughs> identified it well. But it has to go beyond that. I'm not going to talk about the whole Logistics Vision. Uh, I was asked to focus on Gift City as a new paradigm for foreign trade. And uh, that is what I will do. Um, at the heart or the foundation of uh, the Gift City initiative was the changing economics of the aviation ecosystem. And as I was hearing the previous speaker, I heard a very, very important message coming from him about the connectivity of all the interna internal processes with our ports, with our global um, supply chains, etc. But two words were missing. 
I feel. Because these are not really seen, one is financing, how to finance it. Being a Baniya, I work very well with where is the money coming from, who's financing it, where is the money going, profit kahan ja raha hai. So once that is set right, um, I feel that uh, we need to address that. The second important thing I felt that we should address as a collective community is where is the driver for accelerating change within India? Is it physical infrastructure alone, or is it building uh, business processes improvement? Is it simply technological changes in the sizes of ships, in the way uh, containers are built, in the way many other structures are done? Or is it something more? I think something which India has never really addressed adequately is research. Unless all of us, we have 140 crore brains, do we have that many patents, for instance, in the shipping sector? Do we have that, not 140 crores, but even if do we have 140 patents in the shipping sector? So or in the aviation sector, or in any other place. Unless India can be the catalyst for that acceleration, for that change, I think we will always be a net taker from what somebody has developed for their systems. We may readapt it, but it will never have that cutting edge value for us, that economic advantage which the Baniya in me seeks, right? So, when I came to Ministry of Civil Aviation in mid-2017, uh, I looked for finance, as, as I said, but we were very busy with GST taxation, with cargo policy, with uh, skill development, etc. But I asked this question, who's handling aviation finance? It wasn't there. We're leasing all our planes from outside this country. Where is the Indian leasing system? I mean, there was, there was just nothing. So I got landed with these jobs as a result. And uh, so I started looking around at financial hubs in the world. And it was important to see as to where we could make India hub, a financial SEZ. It was already there at Gift City. But when we spoke to Gift City, there was, it has just started, and they were clueless about aviation finance. It's not normal finance which is going to finance the aviation sector. It's a very specialized field. So we looked at aviation finance, and we tried to give the Gift City a propulsion by bringing in this new business. Gift City is a financial SEZ. So it already comes with a lot of advantages. I have put some thoughts here. I'm not going to go into the details because I'll go into the bigger picture. But all I want to say is it's an important initiative which has a twin engine. It has the state government and the union government talking in one voice. You can't go better than that. It's a financial gateway for India that has been envisaged. But where is the Indian money in it? It's all foreign money, which is still propelling much of uh, uh, Gift City. That's where we're trying to see how we can move into specialized aviation finance, marine finance, etc., to come into Gift City so that uh, we can be self-reliant, not inward looking, but outward looking, because Gift City is India offshore. It has all the benefits for you, which an offshore regime today brings to you out of a Dubai or a Singapore or any of the other hubs that you mentioned, or Hong Kong or, uh, you know, Shanghai. Shanghai is not actually a financial hub, but it's a, it's a marine hub nonetheless. So today, if we were to look at the initiatives and what are the gift cities, participants, and activities. So it has banking units, 
It has uh, international stock exchanges and very creatively done. It has insurers and intermediaries aplenty. So you have all your ECB lending, loan syndications, trade finance, and some of the questions which were there in the previous uh, panel towards the end on how Indian banks are not providing uh, finance to the uh, freight forwarders, for instance. Um, all those can be addressed out of Gift City. You have derivatives, currency uh, derivatives, equity and commodity derivatives. Currency derivatives you would know are so important in today's uh, scenario. You have broking services, you have proprietary trading, etc. All in time-bound manner. You have insurance and other uh, aspects as well. I've given the volumes and the number of players, etc. In this short space of time, it's pretty impressive where they have reached. But how did we embed aviation into Gift City? It was a completely de novo exercise. We worked very fast. It's a fast sector. It's flying high. We also tried to do the same thing as far as governance is concerned by being very swift and holistic. Again, I'm going to let you just read through. We made a, a, a full um, project called Rupi Raftar. We worked on what were the promising outlooks in it, the large you know, aircraft order book, growth in air traffic, third largest aircraft order book. We were the seventh largest passenger come, domestic come international passenger aviation market, but domestically we are the third largest passenger market. So everything was there. What I think through the conferences, okay, okay. What we were hearing through uh, the discussions in the previous days and this morning for shipping sector. Everything was there for the aviation, going for the aviation sector. The demand drivers were there. But there were huge lacunae in all the other drivers that were needed. Now, if you look at, as I said, I looked at money. I said, what's the revenue potential if we were to simply bring one aspect into the country out from Gift City, which is aircraft leasing. The revenue potential, we developed our own financial models, we found is five billion US dollars per year. Can you imagine today, just through aircraft leasing from abroad, India on those activities, there are Many of you in the room who are not realizing that gain, you could be doing that. A tax revenue of $200 million per annum. And you know GST tax rates are only 5% on lease rentals. But in the gift city, because it's India offshore, it's zero GST on lease rentals, for instance. So that's where we realized that we can do something from there which will appeal to the government when we present a holistic picture and to industry. You know, and the total value of India's commercial jet backlog, which is the orders that had already been placed, was a whopping $19 billion. And I was there at the Paris uh, air show the biggest announcement of the largest ever engine order was made at the inaugural session before uh, President Micron. Uh, and what was that uh, announcement? Indigo announces a $20 billion um, sale and leaseback arrangement on engines. Nobody had ever seen in the global aviation fraternity, such a big order. It was a proud moment that India was creating global milestones. There are so many milestones we have created since in aviation, and I cannot emphasize it enough again that it happened simply because the entire the entire aviation chain was speaking with one voice, with one common intent, that together we will succeed much better than if we work in silos. 
if I look only at my link and I don't look at the neighboring link or a link which is two links away from me in my supply chain, that was the big thing. Yesterday, somebody said we must learn to trust each other. Avia in aviation, all of you did that, and that is why we succeeded. In shipping, I haven't found that as yet. Huh? As chairperson of the Committee on Ship Acquisition, Financing and Leasing, it's, I, I'll talk about that, but this point I will finish here, which is, that I have not found that coherence there. The volumes are bigger. The value in aviation is 35% of the total trade value. But simply because, you know, all gems and jewelry, diamonds, etc., will go by air. But the volumes in shipping are so large. The actual number of transactions are so large. But all of you are a divided lot. I am really sorry to say that. So, you know, once we did our consultations and our assessment, we moved very fast because the moment you give Indians time to think, wo agar, magar, parantu, etc., you know, where is my gain, where is, is he getting a little bit more will come? So we didn't do that. And if you see 2018 to March 2021, the entire ecosystem had been put in place. Whether it's tax changes, whether it's the regulatory framework, a whole new regulator, a unified regulator called IFSC Authority, International Financial Services Centers Authority was created, and it assumes four other regulators, RBI, SEBI, IRDI, etc. So, you know, it's different. We made processes which were simplified simultaneous in application and an applicant can register within days, within months, depending on how swiftly the applicant acts. It's both in the SEZ process applications as well as the financial regulator, IFSCA processes. This is something for you to look at. Again, these are details for you to look at because they are so compelling, they are so telling as to how we can do it. What are the different elements we need to work on in order not to lose or not to miss out on that one devil in which some detail lies and we have missed it. What were the key attractions which are still there in IFSC gift city, you know, most of the times when we asked industry, what is your wish list, a huge list of taxes only comes to us. Ye tax zero kar do, ye isko hata do, isko. Gift city is India offshore. There are no direct taxes for the first 10 years out of a total period of 15 years for companies that are going to register there. What could be better? No regime in the world no leasing hub. You know, like in, in uh, we saw that there are maritime hubs. There were aircraft leasing hubs, Ireland being the largest, China uh, and earlier USA, China moved swiftly, and uh, Singapore and Dubai and uh, Japan. These were the five biggest hubs for aircraft leasing. India is getting there. Why did we not do it earlier? Don't ask me. But India is now getting there. And if you look at it, there are so many key attractions in it. There's even international regulatory framework under the Cape Town Convention, which is the last point on the right, which, um, you know, I didn't, uh, which, which has been taken care of. You know, no stamp duty, you have nil mat, you have no capital gains tax, you have 10 consecutive years of uh, direct tax holiday, you have, I mean, everything is there. There's a dispute resolution mechanism. We've set up an arbitration center, international arbitration center for all the disputes in it. So we've addressed every So shipping needs to get there. You, you know, most of the times when people say, okay, tell me where the money is, tell me where the money is. So if you look at a comparative, what was the net impact of all that we did? Look at what Ireland, 
which is the biggest aircraft aviation hub, and what we did, if they have 12.5%, we have nil. If there is a minimum capital requirement, but that's a different thing. Ours is only 0.2 dollars. Can any of us afford it? Yes, of course. I'm sure many of you will have that 0.2 million dollars just in your pocket if you were to check it. So, you know, stamp duty, customs duty, withholding tax, everything is nil. GST is on par, capital gains tax. There's none in Gift City, but there's, uh, in Ireland, it's 33%. There's no withholding tax. So, you know, everything that could be given has been done. And I don't want to, again, go through all the business new opportunities that are there, new aircraft leasing and financing platform. You know, it's all online. You register online and blah, blah. I know, I know, I know. I'll just close. Um, there are 15 uh, leasing companies which have set up shop already. Five aircraft have already been imported into India or leased to our airlines by these 15 lessors. 45 more are in the pipeline. So you can see that it's good to go. It's money where the mouth is, mouth where the money is. So it was, you know, all of it. So there are opportunities. What else are we doing out there, which all of you should be aware of? Because the opportunities are limitless. We have digitization, because digitization was one of the most important things over here in this, uh, this uh, pan uh, uh, conference. So we have digital management of the um, regulator, DGCA. We have Easy Bank, and here, a very important platform is being sought to be created, which is an online easy loan options platform for small finance, say up to five crores, which may be needed um, by the aviation sector for any purpose whatsoever. And that would be with all, all the banks tying up and providing that money. We have ESG compliant uh, financing systems as well over there, and opportunities are limitless. So these four last bullets are where the future is coming from. An e-registry of all assets, online trading of aviation assets, marketplace for assets and service providers, and a marketplace for aircraft financing and leasing. I won't go, so this platform I was going to talk a bit more, but I'm not going to do it because that was meant to financially service the underserved, which is the small and the medium size, whether it's aircraft or tugs or containers or what have you. Not going to talk about that. Some key recommendations which have been in the pipeline, I've already mentioned, but I just want to touch on the second bullet point, which is the phase setting up of a digital smart aircraft registry which will have all the financial aspects also dealt with online. So it's really a big, big, big kind of a cloud uh, above us to handle all matters. I'm just going to take two more minutes. Now, on ship acquisition, container uh, acquisition, financing, etc. after the success of Rupi Raftar, I got hauled to give a recommendation on this sector. I was made chairperson, and so the first thing I looked at is, what is the Maritime India Vision 2030? And what the Honorable Finance Minister has said is already there for all of you to look at. They have emphasized everything which our previous speaker has already spoken about, but I would draw your uh, attention to MIV 2030 emphasizes on further boosting performance and productivity of our maritime sector. You know, the economic value that was spoken about. When we did Rupi Raftar, because civil aviation as a ministry was already sold to the ideas, shipping ministry is being pulled back by protectionist interests. Protectionist interests which amount to 6% of India controlled, in India owned tonnage, not India controlled, but India owned tonnage. I think 
a ground swell of movement needs is needed from all of you to realize where the real economic value lies in the shipping trade this is something that needs to be worked out again you have the leading maritime capitals they have addressed finance and law you have to look at finance and law in international maritime law how well versed are we when i asked people to draft something for me for putting into the uh, report because all my recommendations came with actual changes in the notification drafted and given uh, it was a difficult time to get that so we need to be there is the finance yes it is the numbers which i gave you for uh, aviation are multiplied here many multiples for shipping sector there are other critical strategic considerations why we must have ship building ship breaking ship maintenance ship uh, uh, from manufacturing right down to the last activity uh, here in india and financing is where they catch your throat in the world so that is again something that we need to go for again i leave it for all of you to read it i put this slide in red simply because things are not moving we are not building global credibility for the indian maritime sector the need to develop india control tonnage is inadequately addressed addressing the question of availability of finance at cheap cost tax benefits ease of doing business irrespective of who's controlling the tonnage needs to be done again we need to increase india's insurance capacity for the maritime sector i would like all of you to work on that i have given some further details on this maybe you all can read it setting up a maritime arbitration body for international maritime disputes why should you have to go to a singapore or a london to do that i don't think that's correct and on containers the less i say the better because it riles me no end to see what happened on containers in the two years of distress under covid nowhere on earth would it have happened except for india and simply because you have not developed the ethos for container manufacturing and container manufacturing cannot be done individually i have done a whole lot of work on containers i would urge you to to take it up as a special session because i don't have time but container manufacturing and container leasing has to go simultaneously because the top 20 10 uh, companies global that i examined i examined their balance sheets i examined everything they have 50 50 ownership and lease management of containers so importantly from the year 2000 onwards and this is going to be practically my last sentence that a earned 11 to 14 percent on average per annum. These container management and container leasing companies. Do you know they earned in the last two years? This is on the basis of the records they have submitted to the investors. They earned 29.1 percent per annum. Do you not want that to come to you? Because otherwise, you. in india who are the second largest consuming country in the world are paying it through your nose i thank you that was much better than last time i think you all clap very well i think you are going to still some more time wait for your lunch i think thank you very much madam It was an excellent presentation i think uh, thanks to the business session chairman dushyant and uh, shantanu who has been driving this business session i think 
there was a different total perspective here where possibly you brought in the finance and yeah finance and research and you mentioned that is you concluded really without finance the driving force the finance is the driving force for the 5 trillion economy we can't just talk in isolation without talking about yeah we cannot we cannot be talking 5 trillion economy without finance i think possibly in the next time when we have a business session we will also dedicate more for talking about finance and uh, you definitely ident gave us a more insight about gift city as a financial as is that and uh, you one thing i i have been trying to talk to you is what are you going to talk on collaboration when we were talking before uh, no i will i will tell you because i could take one lead from you where you mentioned that this aviation industry is collaborating to create one single policy that's one thing which is possibly lacking in maritime sector so i think we all have got to ensure that what all the bodies together we make a stronger voice as a collaboration for making policy that's one thing i took from your uh, whatever you mentioned thank you very much i will not as uh, i will try to follow shantanu not speak more but still i can't uh, stop from speaking generally people when you get a mic you would like to speak so i will just uh, introduce my next speaker our next speaker is going to be mr k kub bhumi gazda mr uh, again he's been a industry man i think uh, uh, as triple fa we have been never had a very big sponsors or supporters from the aviation industry but this time i am happy we have got many people from the aviation industry on the dais and um, and kiku company before for the last few years they have been sponsoring our triple fa convention thank you very much that uh, currently is no more with that company air india's uh, sub air india's company uh, let me introduce mr kk bomi mazamdar is presently the md and ceo of avio pro logistics services prevent limited part of air cargo industry he was he has been the part of air cargo industry for the past 32 years prior to this he headed india's largest air cargo terminal operation with a presence in over 45 airports and earlier he successfully set up three airlines regional headquarters in dubai saja and chennai he worked with many cargo organization prior to avi pro such as aai cargo logistic and allied services company limited this is the company i was talking who have been supporting triple a convention where he set up india's first road air transshipment via kolkata successfully in 2018 and supported government of india lifeline udan vaccine maitri and krishi udan initiative internationally and domestically he has many feathers in his cap he has been awarded as trial blazer and industry ambassador by ddp in 2018 and 2022 respectively additionally he has been awarded as air cargo person of the year in 2019-20 by akai eastern region he is a new age leader who always willing to learn and lead by example and power of vision thank you very much over to you mr kk respected uh, shankar ji dushan ji leadership team of the triple fa my co-panelists uh my former boss vandana madam ji distinguished guests trade fraternity colleagues ladies and gentlemen i have two tasks uh this afternoon one is to keep you engaged till lunch and the other one is to make this as exciting as possible to take this further is day 3 afternoon sunday you have a house full pack here and i think that's a testament to the association of triple fi to have an engagement of this magnitude where we are gathered to simply exchange ideas and collaborate about the future that's precisely the topic assigned to me as well 
and I hope I do justice to the same, as well as stir up some disruptions in the process. For the sake of brevity, I will keep my premise focused on air cargo, because that's the only topic that I can bravely speak upon. When I received the email from the leadership team about this topic, I did consult the crystal ball on my table for some quick answers. And as always, all I got back was a reflection of myself. And that probably was a start to get me thinking on three questions. One, what do I want the future to be? Two, what do my colleagues, my fraternity want the future to be? And three, most importantly, what do our customers want our future of the aviation sector to be? Let me start with an example that uh, always intrigued me and still intrigues me. My iPhone. Every time I buy an iPhone from, I think, probably four or five version, I always think that this phone is the best, can't get any better. And every time I've, proved it, I've been proved wrong. Somewhere, I think, on the drawing board in California, there's already the plan for iPhone 25 or 30. For those of you who are Gen X like me, you probably would recollect what happened with Nokia in the telecom world and how one fine day, from being a leader in the telecom sector, they crumbled, they failed. They didn't do anything wrong. But what they failed to do was they failed to innovate. One thing's for sure, ladies and gentlemen, and you can quote me on this in five or 10 years from now, the future of air cargo is not going to be in the airports, or for that matter, is not going to be in the seaports. This process has already changed. The future of our business is going to be beyond these facilities. And I'll get to that in a couple of minutes from now. Aviation has always been a booming sector. The working class, the middle class has now risen to dominate the space that traditionally were with the upper elite. So more travel meant more capacity, more capacity meant more aircrafts, more aircrafts in turn meant more bellies to fill. You all have heard of the Indian success story in aviation. You already know well where we are heading towards being the third biggest market of aviation in the world. In the next 10 years, this number will just grow, and we'll be proud of it as we go forward. But there are a couple of things that we need to keep in mind as we move on this journey forward. At some point of time in this foreseeable future, you're going to see that the air freight is going to account for one third of the airline's revenue. Currently, it's somewhere between, let's say, 10, 12 percent. But as we move forward, and as world trade develops further, and as we are going to move more valuable cargo by air, you are going to see these revenues from air freight getting better. Given what the customers supply demand think from the aviation, here is what the shippers look forward to traditionally. Simplicity in process, traceability, transparency, and business that has speed involved in it. This is what we've been doing for the past 100 years. This is what probably we are doing currently at the moment. Let me share you my conviction in a couple of points. You feel free to either disagree or agree with me, and then we'll see how we can take it forward. This is what I believe would happen. Cargo will begin to be secured upstream with a combination of technology and data used to confirm security status throughout the process with security. All the disruptions that we had, all the challenges that we faced in the terminals in the past year because of security concerns are going to slowly reduce. The start of the end of cargo screening at terminals has begun. No more long queues, truck bans, delayed, missed flights, etc. In fact, where necessary, extra controls will be flagged and planned accordingly. Information that you're going to gain from screening the cargo 
will be used to automatically validate booking data and scan shipment documentation. Second, automation will be taken to new heights with autonomous vehicles, robotic systems, drones, allowing operations to accomplish more each day. Productivity, precision, and quality will be enhanced and process waste will be removed. Three, your storage rack function with automatic lift devices or automatic storage and retrieval devices, which allows for closer tracking, will free up time for personnel to continue the task that is being performed by humans today. In many cases, you've already seen this the world over. You are going to see this as we move forward. Four, you are going to see machine learning that will help robots work alongside humans, not just to help robots learn the task, but also supplement where robots will need artificial intelligence to do predictive analysis. Five, the added benefit of ability to reduce the horizontal footprint throughout these efficiency games would be something called augmented reality. This is a fact, it is on its way, it will come to our industry. AR will reduce errors and improve processing times. It will help in satisfaction of our workers and reduce trainings and ongoing competency of assessment burdens. Six, data collection from sensors, electronic documents, etc., will be the tools that will power us in the future far more than what we are used to today. Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard of IoT. You've heard of Internet of Things. Get ready for what I call Internet of Cargo. This is what I like to put it as. A facility that will contribute to the internal process optimization, where better predictive analysis and maintenance needs of the handling equipment and aircrafts would be the future of our businesses. It would, in fact, be the center of our business as we move forward. Eight, deep learning. These are some of the terms probably a lot of you, probably in your IT teams, would be talking about already. But this is something that is going to be embedded into our business as we move forward. Deep learning would be used more extensively within the AI and the AR capabilities. For example, special loads that are now carried on the aircrafts will be determined and automated on the aircrafts which currently are being done manually with information fed into their systems far in advance. This is coming. Nine, all your tracking devices that we currently use in terms of pharma, which is data loggers, etc., you are going to see that getting enhanced with technology. We were talking about 5G, it's already here. The 6 and 7G is already, I believe, in, in the Far East that is being uh, uh, tracked at the moment. You're going to get that as well, which means data that is going to flow between the various stakeholders in, the, in our fraternity is going to be much more clearer, much more faster, much more simpler, and much more transparent. Collaboration between the air freight forwarding community and all of us present here, shippers, forwarders, etc., would have something called predictive data analysis that will come in on a much larger scale. A predictive data analysis is more erring towards what would happen given the set of parameters that you are experiencing at the moment. Earlier, the industry used to rely on data from the manufacturer's index. You had the data coming from the statistical institutes. You had data from GDP. You had data from bank, etc. What's going to happen is you're going to have this combined or embedded into one system, which will factor in the business that you're doing today, along with the other factors that I've just mentioned. challenge of moving cargo around the world will not be limited to air cargo as we see it today, which is moving through aircraft. You are going to see it through drones. 
There are tests. You probably have seen the drone itself. You probably have heard about how drones are already taking uh, packages up to 25 kilos. You already are seeing delivery as of today. It's done. What's going to happen by the 2030 is that you're going to see autonomous vehicles, not VTOLs, but you're going to see autonomous vehicles pick up these kind of loads, which are over a thousand kilos, autonomous, take off land, traveling 500 kilometers, doing this five times a day by some pilot or some rookie sitting in a room in some corner of a building operating this. Imagine the cost implications of this. Imagine the opportunities that are going to be in front of us in the next five to seven years. On a lighter note, for those of you who are planning larger offices in the future for paperwork, may I suggest you do a rethink. You will only need space for servers in your, in your offices, and you will start to employ more data scientists, more programmers, more data engineers than you would do as cargo people. I hope to be proved wrong, but this is what I see that's going to happen. If all of what I've mentioned in the above has got you thinking, let me give you a fun fact. 60 to 70 percent of what I've just said is already in some form in practice today as we speak in some part of the world. It's only a matter of time that we embrace this and find ways how we can deploy this into our businesses as we move forward. I started my talk with those three questions that I'd asked. What do I want the future to be? What do you, my colleagues, trade fraternity, want the future to be? And most importantly, what do our customers want it to be? I would want you to reflect on the above in light of what I've mentioned, discuss, deliberate this. Do remember it's no longer a perform or perish as we learnt it over the past years. Okay? Those were uh, uh, the good old days. The new words that you're going to hear more and more often is going to be innovate or perish, not perform or perish. I'm repeating the word innovate because that is going to be something that you're going to probably need to, need to encompass in your business. Your customers, our customers, are not choosing our organizations because of the rates or the services that we provide any longer. It's no longer the four tack books that we have on our tables that we keep uh, as we had in history. Those were the good old days. Today, ladies and gentlemen, it's all about what value you're going to bring to the table to your customer and how your customer delight is going to involve embracing technology. Lastly, I have been mandated by my chairman in another association called the ACFI uh, to be the head of the knowledge and research vertical. Please feel free to reach out to me. If you do have some suggestions, thoughts, etc., where you would like to have a further debate on this, I will be more than happy to take this forward, not just for the betterment of our industry, but probably in collaboration with the other industries as well, to see how this can be taken forward from here. Ladies and gentlemen, I leave you with three thoughts that I think are the key takeaways from what I have given. One, go green. Two, go blockchain. Three, go innovate. Have a fantastic day and have a very happy Independence Day, Jayant. Thank you very much, Kekuji. Uh, well on time, just in 15 minutes short. short. Um, I think you have been mentioning about future of air freight is beyond airport and seaports. And you have mentioned go green, go blockchain, go innovative. Thank you very much. I think we will follow this. Without wasting much of time, I think we are already finished our session time at 1.30. So we will take another 15 minutes max. I will request this young man to make it, keep it short as possible. 
Um, the next person is a, a young entrepreneur. He, he just started the company just in about just two years back, 2017, and um, he has been um, again a COVID warrior, you can see, because he tried to create a lot of uh, uh, facility to ensure that our uh, freight forwarders are able to use a, uh, what you call, uh, uh, subscription-based platform. Um, I'll just... Uh, Introduce uh, Mr. Raghav Vishwanathan. Uh, is the founder and CEO at Freightify, a technology platform for freight forwarder, and used in 40 countries. Congratulations! After successful stints in organizations like DHL, Panalpina, Vodafone, and HCL. He decided to combine two of his main expertise in technology and logistics to solve complex challenges in freight forwarding. He was involved in moving one of Australia's largest banks from their legacy systems to a more robust, cutting-edge, user-centric, custom-built platform. During COVID, when logistic tech landscape was undergoing rapid change and carriers were digitizing, the company launched their product to help freight forwarders go digital. Thank you very much. This was a very popular among freight forwarders and also got great media coverage for logistics from JOC. Freightify raised venture capital for several investors who shared the vision and believe in the product and company's potential to turn this vision into reality. Thank you very much, Raghav. Over Thanks, to you. Yeah. I think we have got to give a bigger clap. He's from the forwarding industry who is trying to, who has started a new pla yeah. digital platform. Great. Thanks, everyone. And first of all, thank you, leaders at AAAFI, for giving me this opportunity. And I was told to keep the uh, conversation pretty short. And it, as always, everything is expected out of technology to be <laughs> solving most of the problems. And I'll try to keep it as short as possible. Um, and. Um, First of all, I, I would want to mention um, the uniqueness that we have or the biggest advantage that we have in freight forwarding. When other industries were able to adopt technology at a much faster pace, be it banking or retail uh, for that matter, uh, freight, forwarding, uh, freight forwarding or logistics for that matter, pre-COVID, we were not uh, adopting technology to that pace. That's a great advantage, I would say, not a disadvantage, because you could actually take the best practices from other industries. When other industries were rushing into technology, freight forwarding was taking its time. And when COVID hit, uh, when everybody was pushed to take technology, the best practices actually were taken by logistics and freight forwarding. And we could see, actually, the industry embrace technology pretty well. And uh, like I mentioned, uh, we are shipping products to more than 40 countries, building from India and shipping it to more than 40 countries. We could see that freight forwarding and logistics, they were agile in adopting technologies because uh, they know that they are the lifeline of trade. Uh, and uh, pre-COVID, the question used to be asked, will freight forwarders exist, exist in the ecosystem? Uh, people used to come and ask that, are we going to be um, uh, are we going to be substituted by a platform or a technology or a robot or f for that matter? Pre-COVID, this question was asked. Post-COVID, I think that question is already answered. Uh, otherwise, we would not be having AAAFI having such a getting bigger and better and ha having at ITC in, in, in Chennai. So we are making money. This industry has always lived by sales is vanity, profit is sanity, cash flow is reality. So whichever industry lives, as, lives by cash flow is reality, will survive and triple F and freight forwarders for that matter are surviving. And this is the moment to thrive, right? And uh, this is where uh, the, the industry is actually looking at thriving, using technology to the advantage rather than uh, trying to uh, see whether technology is a threat. And uh, some, some may be even convinced that the, your job, you're not going to be going out of jobs in the future because technology is here to help. So with that as a baseline, that technology is not going to substitute anyone uh, or any industry for that matter, 
let me start by saying what's happening to this industry. Right? Um, and uh, now technology is used as an enabler a lot more rather than a disruptor because every, uh, a lot of people are talking about technology in this ecosystem or any conference for that matter that's more heartening to see. So uh, the biggest uh, point in that is we all know what has to be done. So in, just to give an example, if you want to lead a great life, we all know that good sleep, eat healthy, and do physical workout. That's been said all the time, but very few people follow. Right? Same way in technology, we all know that we need to st start building the database, we need to start uh, making sure that we follow smaller processes online, put it on cloud, and so on and so forth. But uh, the adoption is uh, lesser, but since it's happening now, it's also heartening to see. Right? Uh, technol forwarders who are using technology as an enabler to, uh, to make their efficiency better are actually closing a lot more deals than forwarders who are not forwarders who think of technology as a disadvantage. We are seeing freight forwarders doubling their probability of winning shipments increase by using technology to their advantage. And uh, people are really moving away from talks of what can blockchain do in logistics or what can AI do in logistics or ML do in logistics. So people are moving away from what can a technology do to what kind of initiatives have to be taken. So moving from what a particular technology does to uh, what initiative I have to take to go green, what, I, what should I do or what my company should do uh, and what kind of uh, processes to be followed is what uh, is being talked a lot more and technology is just an enabler to that as well. And like any other industry, uh, we can see that a lot in food tech for that matter. Uh, industry, companies have moved from being a generalist to a specialist, which means that uh, two, two, three years back, there were restaurants which served everything under the roof, and we used to go there. And now restaurants are very focused on one thing. You can find restaurants, like in Chennai, you are here, you can find Murugan Idli serving only Idli to a great advantage, uh, Behros Biryani doing only Biryani, and they are becoming a lot more popular. So I think even in this industry, forwarders need to think about, or custom brokers need to think about what's your expertise and go from a generalist kind of an approach to a specialist and start building processes there. Say that 80% of my revenue is coming from, uh, or will come in the next five years from this kind of uh, an activity that we do, and we want it to be the best in that. So that's happening in other industry, and uh, technology can really provide workflows for being a specialist. And uh, Gen Z is entering. So uh, Sir spoke about Gen X, and uh, now Gen Z is entering. And Gen Z is expecting everything to be in a self-serve kind of a model. So uh, the uh, overall efficiency doesn't stop with uh, your ecosystem alone, a freight forward alone. It's expected by the customer where Gen Z is entering. It's expected by the uh, banks where Gen Z is entering and expected by shipping lines where the new generation is entering. And the, this industry is moving to mobile first. So mobile first, when I mean it's not just opening up mobiles and w looking at emails or co doing calls on mobile. Mobile first, when I mean using mobile to the greatest of potential, right? And uh, when I say greatest of potential, mobiles are evolving, but still we are using mobiles primarily for calls. But uh, you can use mobiles to uh, basically transcribe the whole conversation that we have. There is a button below your keyboard on the right hand side which has a microphone. I'm pretty sure not a lot of people would have used it. You just click that button, automatically it will transcribe all the conversation that is happening right now and it can become a note taking for yourself. So mobile first economy is happening and uh, Gen Z is expecting everything to be done on mobile. I can see a lot of people in, the, uh, uh, in this ecosystem build, bringing your next generation to learn about uh, freight forwarding and building, building the networking. So the next generation is not interested in doing day-to-day -day activities. They wanted to be mobile first and get everything instantly. So we feel that, uh, especially in India, uh, freight forwarders want to do most of the activities on mobile and want to build processes which are mobile friendly as well. Uh, this generation is a lot more objective and they use a lot of tools to analyze the market. So data is being looked as the next big thing, especially with the markets. Uh, if, if you look at it in the last two years, markets have risen and right now it looks like it is falling and then again it will stabilize and rise. So you need to have a very strong data indicator uh, to know how the markets are evolving and uh, that's, that's how industries are going to evolve. Invest in a lot of data 
tools or invest in a lot of uh, tools which can give you index or market uh, situation. I'm pretty sure that for, for the industry that we are in the last five years, we would not have invested a lot on data. Not our data, but external data for that matter. So invest in uh, a lot of research data and uh, start uh, 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 involving in that. And uh, gig economy is building. So uh, for people who don't know what is gig economy, a lot of low touch points like uh, artists, designers, uh, a lot of people go out of their company and start their own practice as an individual. And in the last one year, we have seen, especially in markets like India, we have seen salespeople going out of their respective organizations, setting up their own uh, shop or small uh, company and starting their own gig economy. So just think about what will happen when freight forwarding becomes a gig economy, when a lot of people, a small, uh, indu when an individual goes out of a company and starts uh, um, do, setting shop on their own. So it, it's just a thought. I also don't have a, an answer for that. But if gig economy comes to freight forwarding in the next five to uh, ten years, how, how will the industry change is something that we have to think about. And think of uh, technology as an investment rather than an expenditure. A lot of people have told that. So I, like I told you, the next generation is entering freight forwarding. You are thinking of that as an investment to cultivate the next generation and make them come into your organization and uh, take over. So think of technology as your next generation. So invest in technology, have patience in technology. Don't expect technology to do magics from day one. So technology is going to take its own time to get uh, used to uh, the processes involved. It's going to affect in a different way with different companies, and it's, there's, it's, there's no one size fit all. So invest in technology and think of it as your next generation and uh, move forward there. A couple of actionables for companies here. Uh, I'll take another 30 seconds. Work within the system. So you have a great system in place. That's why you're making money. Uh, you've been... Uh, uh, all weather proof as a as an uh, industry so work within the system and try to analyze your strength and use technology to, to your advantage uh, find data sources like i mentioned invest a lot of money in data at least 5% of your company's expenses in data so that you can understand what's what's going on in the uh, outer uh, outside your company and ensure that these data can help you manage your own data pretty well so that you can compare this data with your external data points Focus a lot on internal communication. Um, there are co tools like Slack, Communicator, and so on and so forth. So emails are the thing of the past, especially Gen Z thinks so. So th start using internal communication tools, which can strengthen your organization DNA. And uh, organize your workflow a lot more with technology. There are a lot of technology enablers across the ecosystem and who are ready to not just disrupt the economy, but also uh, enable the existing players in the economy. Uh, look for enablers invest in enablers, uh, tie them to your uh, profits or tie them to your uh, milestones. And uh, I think there's, there's always good things in store. Uh, like I told you, cash is reality. This industry has lived by it. And I'm pretty sure this industry is going to grow leaps and bounds. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Raghav. It was a lot of informative speech that you gave, a lot of advices you have shared with us. I think technology as an investment and technology will not substitute. Technology is a growth enabler, wonderful. I think even on the cash, you mentioned you made a quote. I think we have, we have noted all the points. I think people here must have noted again. I will not take again much of time. I think the summarization is not mine. It's the job of my colleague, Mr. Sudhir Agarwal. Over to Sudhir. Good afternoon, everyone. So just looking at the watch, we are just nearing 2 p.m. now, and everybody is hungry, not going to take much time. What I can see, I was listening uh, uh, last four sessions we already had. Today, we had two sessions. The only thing I can get from it is that India has got everything. Like we are the second biggest consumers. We have got the second biggest com uh, consumer in the world. We are a growing economy. We are progressing towards 5 trillion. We have got all kind of infrastructure. What we need is like yesterday, the keyword was planning. Then today, when I was going through various uh, technology, innovation, and I think we have got the best brain uh, to uh, bring in all the talent which we need. And uh, only thing is we have to focus on our strength 
And I think uh, the, when we decided on this theme, logistics reshape, embrace and surge in the digital era, we, we, uh, because we were, as a custom broker, we were knowing that our future is not in our traditional way of doing. Uh, now, as the things are improving, the, the, you know, the word disruption is, uh, is told many times, but I don't think that there is anything like disruption. It is only the technology, technological inno innovation which is uh, uh, growing at a very faster pace and we are not somehow able to catch with it. So as a custom broker, sometimes uh, being a chartered accountant now for 50, I, I also feel I am redundant as far as technology is concerned. So my, I think the big takeaway by Triple FAI will be that ki as an organization now we, will, we should focus on training towards, uh, you know, uh, uh, make our member uh, more digitally aware about how things can be done in this era of uh, uh, digital era, how we should uh, embrace the technology to improve our business. So as far as the session is concerned, I am thankful to Radha Krishnanji, our past chairman and advisor for moderating it. The session was very, very informative. The first speaker talked about the in, uh, port infrastructure. I am thankful to Mr. Uh, NRS uh, Karuneshan, sir. Sorry, I am not able to pronounce your name maybe correctly, but uh, th I'm thankful to you for giving the insight how India is progressing, what is the infrastructure we will be requiring times to come. Then Vandana Agarwalji came, she talked about the gift city and the opportunity it has created in terms of financing and leasing for the aircraft industry and there is an opportunity for shipping and containers also. Then Keku Gazdarji taught, told about what is, what, how uh, technology is changing the aviation industry and then how uh, then Raghavendraji told about the technology which is uh, making uh, business more enabling in times to come. While all this discussion was going on, when Vandana ji was saying something about Banya, I being also Agarwal, that Banya in, uh, thing, uh, uh, that insight has come into me. As an organization, Triple FAI, when we were in last three, four years, we were trying ki how we can grow our organization. We had all the, uh, in, we had all the infrastructure, but somehow we were lacking in, in terms of our branding. Uh, 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 outreach was not much there. Then we, uh, we had a thought process. And what I can see, what Gift City has done, in a similar way we have done, we have created more branding, we have created more awareness. Then money was a challenge because being a small organization, we had limited resources. We did something that money automatically came. We decided about this convention. Many people supported it. Now we are uh, growing up with this idea that we can put more money into the system and have more people and make our members uh, more informative about you know, technology or uh, as an organization, we can make um, better represent, uh, representation to the government. So I think uh, uh, with, the, with the resources we are having internally, it is only like uh, we have to put, uh, put more focus on planning and channelize it and the result will come automatically. I think this is all logistics all about. I am thankful to each one of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sudhir. Uh, thank you all panelists for uh, this wonderful session. Um, I would like to also take this opportunity to one because uh, I noticed that I am the senior most uh, past chairman present at this house. I think why my, I want to take the, uh, if I don't say this, it's wrong on my part that as this was a wonderful convention. I would like to congratulate uh, chairman and the business session organizers. I think every, every topic that was chosen was excellent. I think on behalf of entire community sitting here, also on behalf of all the past chairman and advisors, excellent job, congratulations. Thank you, thank you so much, sir. It was a fantastic there are many, session. Uh, no, I said I am the senior most sitting here. There are many uh, of them who are not here at this moment. They have not been able to attend. Uh, one minute, Vandana ji wants to ask some questions. I think uh, we will take that question one or two, then we'll close the session. Sorry, I don't want to take the floor. But just one question, normally I, I was going to raise it when the audience asks a question. As a panelist, I wanted to ask the audience a question. 
cataclysmic transformations are called for because just the steady pace will not do. Do you think that in addressing one of the main issues is the container issue, you are willing as a body to set up an SPD, say in Gift City, bringing in thereby the numbers as well as sharing the risk. Of course, the ownership can be fragmented. There are ways of doing fragmented ownership, fragmented rights and responsibilities. We see that in aircraft. Are you willing to work with that? Gift City provides an opportunity. Why don't all of you debate on that? If you think it's a good idea, then an ownership structure can always be worked out, which benefits the Indian community. And we can prevent the humongous amount of money which is going out in container leasing or container rentals by all of us in India. Ultimately, the consumer pays. But let's see. If we can make something which is different in the shipping sector to start with. Okay. So this question has come from Mr. Jairaman Krishnan. He has asked this question to Keiko Bhumi Gazdar. How can air cargo integrate with multimodal transport to increase its price attraction? Thank you. Uh, I'll make it really short. Uh, three parts to that answer. One, you already have an organization here called Amtoy. I saw Mr. Zaxas Master here who, who can uh, give you a lot of information what is currently being done. Two, this is nothing new that has been asked about. Uh, CR has been done over the past decades uh, all over the world. Although this is not caught up so much in our country due to certain reasons. Three, Yes, uh, as part of our previous organization, we already started the, the, uh, the air uh, road movement and this has added tremendous value to all our businesses across the platform. In fact, the government is very, very encourageable, uh, thanks to also Madam when she was uh, the additional secretary, to open up this value chain of having more and more businesses of air collaborate with the shipping industry. There are challenges that we are facing in terms of the logistics part of it, but I think together with the, with the experience and expertise of all of us present here, this is surely doable. I hope I've answered uh, your question. Thank you, Kekoji. I think uh, we will conclude because we are already reaching 2 o'clock. I think other sessions are got to be on time. And uh, any question that you have, you can forward to AAAFA. They will ensure you all get the answers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, dignitaries. Thank you so much, your moderator and the panelists. I hope we can give a big round of applause to them. That was a fantastic session that you all had. Thank you so much. And now I would request uh, Mr. Shankar Shinde and A.V. Vijay Kumar to present the memento as our token of appreciation to Mr. R. Radhakrishnan. So we would request you to, uh, both of you, please welcome onto the stage. Next, I would like to request Mr. Radha Krishnan to present the memento to Mr. Ennarasu Karunisan from IAPH Regional Director to India. An applause, please. And I'll request Mr. Radha Krishnan to present the moment to, to Srimati Vandana Agarwal, Senior Economic Advisor, MOCA, Retired Chairperson Committee on SAFAL, IFCA, Gift City. Thank you, ma'am, for your valuable time. And I once again, I request Mr. Radha Krishnan to present the moment to 
to Mr. Keku Bumi Gazdir, MD and CEO, AVI Pro Logistics Service Private Limited. And again, I would request Mr. Radha Krishnan to present the memento to Mr. Raghavendra Vishwanathan, CEO of Frightify. Thank you. And can we all stand together for a group photo, please? I would request the dignitaries and uh, Shankar Shinde and A.V. Vijay Kumar and the panelists please stay back for a group picture. And next is coming up, we have um, the sponsor, um, the business sponsor is sponsored by Men 